I will read a poem to you, a poem written by our internationally renowned politician, author, and former ICC president, Akkaluk Lunge. I think the poem, the little woman, fits the theme of this conference, enlightening knowledge. Yeah. First your husband died, and later your brother, and the journey had not even begun. In spite of this, you made a big decision, which later became the long slit journey. You participated in all the difficulties for a woman, a journey was a journey, and work was something that had to be done, whether it was a man's or a woman's. After a hard day's travel, Cam had, uh, had to be made. You had to provide something warm, see the lamp was lit, and food was cooked. Later, you sat on the sleeping platform with back bent over the skin, with the cutting board and the ulu, a piece of fur, some sinew, and a needle. Yes. The stitches, yes? The stitches you sewed were as many as the steps of your journey. When you drew the sinew thread up across your cheek to smooth it out, what did your eyes see? What thoughts traveled through your mind? Your long journey, which became one man's honor, was for you just a passage, a hunting trip, like so many others. You sat alone with your eyes, look, looking upon a life you fully enjoyed. With the two men of the sled, you helped to push and pull, sweet soaked in the cold. Uh, you went along on a hunt after food, the hunt for survival. What were your innermost thoughts in the merciless hunt after fame, which meant nothing to you? What was that glory to you? Who knew that the giving of life, the preservation of life, is far better than glory? Everywhere, yes. <laughs> everywhere you have been, you and Mitchell are remembered. Everywhere you have been, Annaulungwa, your good nature, your smile and laughter are remembered. No one has created a memorial or statue of, of book. But the strength of your spirit remains a link for, for our people. Without you, the world would be much smaller and our journey unfulfilled. Yeah. The poem is about a Greenlandic woman, Anna Ulungwa, who participated in Knud Rasmussen's three year long fifth tool expedition from 1921 to 23. She was in charge of the food and responsible for maintaining skin and fur clothing and life and death um, responsibility in the Arctic. She had knowledge of opt optimal cooking techniques under extreme conditions. She was an excellent seamstress, an expert in constructing a soldier in Arctic um, condition and a strong travel companion with great endurance. For a hunter to be able to carry out his demanding craft in, in Arctic, he needed to be accompanied by a woman who mastered uh, the preparation of fur and was able to sew the skin to make clothing, which requires meticulous maintenance by skilled hands. A hunter's wife was the key to his hunt, hunting success. Anna Rolungwa was just that kind of woman, and she completed the trip as a natural part of her life, not something that you, uh, you would make a big deal about. Greenland researcher Jan Andersen writes that the Greenlanders have not, as is otherwise often claimed, lived secluded from science. They have been participants. The reports from expeditions in the 19th and 20th century contain the names of numerous Greenlanders who played a role in connection with scientific activity. These are people who have participated in the expeditions as sled drivers, hunters, guides, 
interpreters and cultural interpreters, for not to mention women like Anna Olungwa, who had a great responsibility for the survival of her expedition. On many occasions, Greenlandic participants came to sacrifice their lives in the service of science. One such example is Greenlander Rasmus Willumsen, who died in 1930s together with Alfred Wegener in the inland ice. Another example is Jørn Ponlon, who lost his life in 1907 during the Danish expedition. In many cases, these Greenlanders made key contributions to the success of expeditions, and their presence has often been crucial to the survival and personal success of foreign scientists. The Greenlandic expedition participants, who as a rule appear at the bottom of the list of ex expedition participants, are ordinary people who have learned scientific craftsmanship through learning by doing. With their unique skill sets, these persons have comprised an exclusive labor market. Science is not carried out by great scientists alone. Elisabeth Dorsuit. Science is often only possible with the participation of a number of persons who do not actually have a scientific education. Whether dealing with exploration, expedition, missionaries, or like today with the important research carried out by laymen, Greenlanders have been of decisive significance for the accumulation of knowledge about Greenland. Elisabeth yeah. Safik uh, celebrated its 30th anniversary last month. The creation of a research and teaching institute was proposed by the Greenland National Council back in 1973. And the idea of establishing the Inuit department and the transition to a genuine university occurred shortly after the introduction of Greenland Home Rule. As such, the Inuit department was established in 1983 in Nook. And by 1987, Elisabeth Dussarfik had four institutes under the leadership of Rupert Pedersen, the man behind the university. Yeah. In 2008, Elisabeth Dussarfik moved into a new, large, and beautiful building, which houses seven of the education program offered by the university. Today, Elisabeth Dussarfik has been expanded from its previous four classic university programs, the Department of um, Language, Literature, and Media, the Department of Culture and Social History, the Department of Social Science, and the Department of Theology. So as now also to include six profession-oriented uh, programs, education, nursing, journalism, and social work together with the newly established translation and interpreter program. In the 2009 to 2013 period, student admission to Elisabeth Dussarfik have been increasing, such that 171 students were admitted in 2013, just as the number of graduates has been increasing, even though it is still necessary to improve the completion rate. In terms of education history, Greenlanders were already able to pursue an education in trade and mission in the 19th century, where they were sent to Denmark to get an education. In the period after 1950, the Danish government initiated a large-scale modernization process in Greenland, a process that required educated labor. Since the 1950s and until this day, Several thousand children and youth from Greenland have therefore been sent to Denmark for school and training. A modern independent Greenland requires training and education on all levels of society. Education therefore remains a top priority and the number of persons with an education has been steadily increasing since 2002. As of 2012, 14,781 persons 
corresponding to 34.7% of the population over age of 17 have an education. Even though there is still something of a deficit in terms of educating enough Greenlanders in ter terms of education history, major changes have occurred in Greenland. No. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Elisabeth Osarfik has two main missions. One, producing graduates from bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs at the university to meet the needs of Greenlandic society. And two, to carry out research. The establishment of Elisabeth Osarfik has undoubtedly been used in and benefited the national formation process in Greenland and the further construction of the nation. But most importantly, Elisabeth Usafik has made it possible for Greenlanders to pursue a university degree without having to leave their country. Just as Greenlandic students are now able to receive instruction in their own language. Prior to the establishment of Elisabeth Usafik, the norm was um, for Greenlanders to pursue their university education abroad, a practice which continues today as there are still some university education that is not possible to take in the country. Before I, I begin my discussion of the, the significance of Elisimetu Safik for research, I would like to make some brief comments about the history of research in Greenland. In 2012, the Commission of Scientific Research was disbanded, replaced by the Greenland Research Council uh, in May this year. In practice, the creation of this council represents a kind of repatriation of the research consultancy in Greenland. The Commission of, uh, for Scientific Research in Greenland has existed since 1878 that is 136 years. In all that time, Greenland has been an important field that Danish cultural and social research had, has worked. And the research that has been carried out in, in the period up until the introduction of home rule is to be seen in relation to the colonial past between Greenland and Denmark. In many respects, this research reflects the relation between these two countries in different periods, and the areas in which research is carried out reflects the interest of Denmark and Greenland. The introduction of Home Rule shifted the initi initiative behind uh, the administration of research to Greenland. At roughly the same time, Elisabeth Usafik was established which lay the foundation for a Greenlandic university with its own agenda for research in and about Greenland. As Professor Robert Peterson points out, the founding of Greenland has been a liberation from intellectual colonialism. Peterson writes, Ilim Mafik and other cultural institutions under the Home Rule can be regarded as a kind of liberation from that which we could call intellectual colonialism. As Greenland now contribute much more actively to information and opinions about Greenland and the development of the society in, in Greenland. A senior consultant Per Lango from Greenland Language Secretariat also notes the si significance of Elisabeth Usafik's locally roaded research and its significance for Greenland. And he writes, in my opinion, one of the most important innovation that Elisabeth Usafik uh, has introduced to Home Rule has been the locally produced objective documentation in the field we already mastered. The fact that we found ourselves in the middle of the data as opposed to our visiting colleagues together with our very rapid access to the media, led to our result receiving a lot more attention than those of our visiting colleagues for the very reason that they were local, largely obtained and disseminated in Greenland. 
Without a doubt, the locally based research in Elysima du Sarfin has had major significance for Greenland and for the research in Arctic in general. Another important initiative that is of great significance for promoting research in Elysima du Sarfin and Greenland was the introduction of the research program in 2001, which allowed the institution to award PhD and enroll uh, PhD students. In 2009, Elysima du Sarfik awarded its first PhD. Since that time, six more PhD degrees have been awarded. Today, Elysima du Sarfik has 10 PhD students, several of whom enjoy du dual en enrollment in collaboration with other universities. Another important form of colla uh, collaboration that deserves mention in this context is IPSA's PhD program or International PhD uh, School for Studies of Arctic Societies, which include universities from Greenland, Denmark, Canada, Alaska, and France and Scotland. I, I better remember all the lands. <laughs> With the introduction of the PhD decree, Elisima Dusarfik is sending a signal that it will continue to improve its research activity and the recruitment of researchers in the future. For the founders of Elisima Dusarfik, it was very important um, to for the institution to establish itself as an internationally recognized university an institution marked by academic excellence, where the motto was quality first and then Greenlandic. About this, Professor Robert Peterson writes the following. Yes. First and foremost, I'm of the opinion that it must be a university that lives up to Nordic standards, and thereafter that the Greenlandic studies must be, must be top notch that it must educate Greenlandic ad academic employees, and then also that the people of Greenland must be proud to have this university as their own. From the very beginning, international collaboration with other universities and research institutes has been important for Elisima du Sarfik in order to ensure international interaction and and a level of research and teaching on par with other international institutions. Interest in working together with Elisima du Sarfik has been increasing dramatically in recent years. And the increased interest for Greenland in international community can be seen in relation to climate change and the effort to exploit Greenlandic, Greenlandic natural resources. This makes it absolutely imperative for Elisima du Sarfik to work together with the international community and research institutions. In turn, international research institution also needs the knowledge found in Elisima du Sarfik. It is therefore very important that everyone working with Arctic research work together across national borders and disciplines there is a need for all of the available forces in the rapidly changing Arctic. Finally, on the basis of my own PhD dissertation, I would like to say something about carrying out research in your own community, about which advantages and disadvantages this can involve. I gained my first experience with carrying out research in my own community when I started studying at Elisima du Sarfik in the 1990s. Since then, after having received my master's degree, I decided to apply for a PhD scholarship, which I started when, I became when it became possible to pursue an education as a researcher at Elisima du Sarfik. My PhD dissertation is entitled Family Relations and Gender in Greenlandic Towns, uh, Feelings of co uh, collected, uh, Connectedness. Since completing my dissertation, I have continued to research in the complex Greenlandic kinship system. And in contrast to the past, I am now participating in an interdisciplinary project entitled Population Dynamics in Greenland, together with researchers from Montana State University and Indiana University. 
This project has already provided me great insight into the importance of international interdisciplinary collaboration, as well as insight into the difference between doing research from the inside and from the outside. But the question related, related to conducting research home and abroad are not simple. First, one can ask, what is home and what is abroad? A question which does not become simpler when this home used to be an ethnographically exotic film. As an Inuit anthropologist, this becomes a matter of returning from the exotic, which now has become normal, to a home, and from there to engage in coming home. Doing insider research entails the study of part of one's own reality. According to Norwegian anthropologists, well, it is in many ways easier on a practical level to carry out fieldwork in one's own culture, as there is no language barrier. Just as one presumably also shares many things in common together with those one is studying. When we carry out field work in our own culture. We draw upon that which Anthony Giddens refers to as mutual knowledge. In other words, it is not academic insight that initially readies the field worker, field worker to understand that which they are observing, but rather the common collective knowledge that they share together with those they are studying. This common knowledge is extensive and precisely that which makes it difficult to discover and verbalize everything that is taken for granted. It is therefore important to remain aware of how familiarity with a culture can lead to cultural blindness, a problem which is greater in fieldwork within one's own circles than in fieldwork in foreign cultures. In the course of field work, I have found that I have easily been able to step into the field and focus on that which I initially found important. Conversely, my familiarity with the field has also rendered me blind on a, on a number of occasions where I have been particularly blind in the first phase of my field work has been in relation to the children who have grown up with their grandparents. I grew, up, I grew up with my own grandparents, and I know a lot of people who have grown up with families other than their biological parents. I actually first became aware of the phenomenon in the course of an interview with an older man. Um, a young woman showed up with her son. We greeted one another, and I asked whether uh, this was his grandchild. He answered immediately that this was his youngest daughter. After the, the young woman had, had left, he explained to me that she was his grandchild whom they had adopted as an infant. He explained further that it made their youngest daughter sad when people asked whether she was his grandchild. I had read about the phenomenon without really wondering about it. The incident woke me somehow, and I became aware that it was also a subject of significance towards a better understanding of Greenlandic kinship. Danish psychologist Yedefo writes that the interviewer uses themselves as an instrument. It is therefore also important that you figure out what kind of instrument you are. Fo also writes about introspection among those working with qualitative method in which there is a kind of double movement. First, I have to turn my gaze outward, out to the case, out to the reality that I am attempting, attempting to comprehend a part of. Secondly, the gaze must be turned inwards towards myself, towards the immediate and unreflected meaning that the case might hold for me, and which one way or another affects me. Or as Foe writes so clearly, if you, have, if, if you have to use yourself, you have 
to at least have some grasp about your blind spots. That I come from the inside means that I am also a part of an active element in the family landscapes that people in Greenland are co constantly updating, passing on, and informing one about. I recognize the similarities and differences in the informants' narratives about their kinship. And in my attempt to un understand their family lives, I thus draw upon my own kinship experiences. One might ask whether my personal background or familiarity with the culture can or has gotten in the way of my collection of data. Norwegian anthropologist Kry uh, Palsgaard is, is of the opinion that researchers who is coming from within must go to greater length to account for their own rule in the production of data than a researcher who is coming from the outside. But she does not believe that th this means that our personal background represents a major obstacle. Even if we were to produce different data than the researchers who are foreign to the culture. Paul Skoll is also of the opinion that cult cultural blindness is curable, as it is possible to make observation along the way, receive comments from peers, refer to theoretical models and perspectives that can provide the researcher who is coming from within um, with the distance necessary to see clearly that which they only previously had an implicit and diffuse perception of. As the local lifestyles and cultures have become a part of the global network, one's own culture is almost everywhere around the world. The danger of home blindness resulting from cultural familiarity is therefore present even though one has traveled far from home to do field work. Regardless of whether the researcher is from near or distant culture, in the course of the data production, the researcher must be able to go in and participate within the context under investigation and be able to place themselves outside so to speak, in order to select, categorize, and analyze the experiences collected in the course of field work. Another important perspective that one should be aware of when carrying out research in one's own community or society is the researcher's constant need for reflexivity, not just in relation to the research pro project process and quality, but also in relation to the surrounding community. As those doing insider research must live with the consequences or results that this research has produced, Professor of Indigenous Education Linda Tuhiva Smith writes the following on the subject. The critical issue with insider research is the constant need for re reflexivity. At a general level, insider researchers have to have ways of thinking critically about their process, their relationships, and the quality and richness of their data and analysis. So too do outsiders, but the major difference is that insiders have to live with the consequences of their process on a day-to-day -day basis forevermore, and so do their families and communities. In conclusion, on carrying out research in one's own community, I would like to say that it is very important to carry out research in one's own community, just as it is important for research to constantly contribute to the development of methods for research in one's own community. I have been asked to say something about how Inuit knowledge, Kamana, can contribute to enlightened universal knowledge. The Inuit have always been participating in and contributing to enlightened universal knowledge, as the poem about Annaulungwa showed. Former ICC President Dr. Luk Lunge, in his keynote speech at ICAS 2008, 
pointed out the importance of a partnership in the Arctic between Inuit and the scientific community. In his speech, Lunge re recommends that Arctic researchers should communicate and sh share their knowledge together with the Inuit, while at the same time asking the scientific community to respect indigenous experience-based knowledge and culture. I think that Akaluk Lunge's message remains valid and is of paramount importance. Furthermore, if, furthermore it remains important for the Inuit communities and research to work closely together in order to solve the major future challenges that the Arctic and global society are facing. But for the Inuit to be able to take control over research activities and contribute to the universal knowledge, it is important that researchers are educated from within their own ranks to to a greater degree than has been the case in the past. I believe that this is of the greatest importance if greater participation in research locally and globally is to become a reality in the future. Bueno.